Astrology of Terrible Things podcast with me, Carly Heath, and my friend, co-host, Jesse Devine. This is a podcast where we bring you stories of terrible things that have happened to people, and then we delve into the astrology of that terrible thing to try to figure out why bad things happen. Important note, this podcast comes with all the trigger warnings. Uh, we talk about amusement park disasters, serial killers, catastrophic accidents, and all the sorts of events that usually result in people dying. And if any... <laughs> why are you laughing? You are a terrible person, Jesse. You're, you're, That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Like, I... <laughs> sorry. Oh my gosh, the hate mail! I can view it coming in as soon as <laughs> as soon as Carly mentions people dying, Jesse starts cr- cackling. Well, listen, listen, listen. The hate mail be just for me. It's okay. <laughs> Which actually bring brings up a really important note: Who the fuck are you, and why are you doing this? Uh, and I I do have to ad- address uh, the human weird nature, especially for people who have anxiety of studying and exploring the extremely morbid and what is that? What is that human uh, need to, when I find out about a murder or a serial killer or a crime that is terrible, why do I need to know every single thing about that? crime and the person committing it. I, yeah, I, I, there's this, I want to mi- see if there's a way that I could have that thing not happen to me. Mm-hmm. So there's that part of it. There's the part of it where like, that is an extreme experience that a human went through. And I want to know what that was like. Mm-hmm. I, we did get, get a little sidetracked and off track there. <laughs> I didn't finish my paragraph, which was my bad guys. We talk about all sorts of events that usually result in people dying. We are not terrible people. (laughs) We genuinely feel awful about terrible things happening to people. Obviously, like when when we when I hear a story of a just a, a horrific event, my first reaction is to go, "Oh my god, that's awful." Mm-hmm. My second reaction is I want to know every single thing about that thing. We want to delve into whatever that is that attracts our attention so much about horrible things. Yeah. And I don't think I laugh at like, I think I laugh at like the absurdity of the universe sometimes. You were just listing like all of the, and I know that like that list is just a very short list of compared to all of the things that we actually touch on. So, you know, I think I just laugh sometimes because it's like, how, like how, (laughs) how do all these things happen people all the time you know I just I don't really know how else to handle it so I think I just laugh if anything that we've talked about in the first like three minutes of the show is offensive to you or triggering this is definitely not the show for you I want to understand the universe I want to understand why is it that bad things happen and that's why astrology I think it draws so much many of us because it it's a language that tells us about karma and so when we describe a distressing situation that gets our attention then we pull up the astrology and we examine it in the in terms of archetypes and in terms of the astrological language of the cosmos it helps to um, describe the human experience a little bit I think Mm, yeah and I think for those of us that know I mean like you're the you're the astrology expert here I think for those of us that know less about astrology um like I was talking about understanding the why earlier like when tragedies happen And then you can look at, you know, a chart and then see like, oh, well, it wasn't completely random. Like, you can understand. That's what's amazing. Whenever I look at a chart for like the San Francisco earthquake, the Donner Party, the uh, World Trade Center uh, disaster, it's not a quiet chart. It's never like, oh, that's, you know, that was a weird random day. It's always like, wow, it happened at an exact moment where a thing hit the ascendant, where the moon was doing a thing, where there was a Mercury Kazemi, where uh, it w- it's it's a, it's always like a very specific, loud, very amazing there's chart. There's a clear reason. Like there's yeah. a clear, yeah. What we're talking about this week is a something that happened in my hometown. And I think everyone, I think, I'm... Uh, 
I, I think I got this idea from uh, my favorite murder because they talk about hometown. <laughs> Do you have a favorite murder? I'm very obsessed with the Lori Daybell okay. trial right okay. now. And I think that's kind of consuming all my attention. <laughs> Uh, and I also the Brian Koberger uh, Idaho Four is consuming all my attention right now, and that's he's a big old Scorpio stellium right there. Um, Man, Scorpios don't need any help being. Uh, nobody likes Scorpio. I love Scorpios. Nobody likes Scorpios. <laughs> yeah, well, those people who have you actually have a Venus in Scorpio. Yeah. Gosh, so many serial killers have Venus in Scorpio. Now, obviously, <laughs> not Jesse is not going to be serial killing. For everyone listening, this is the first uh, time she's told me that. This is a oh really? Yeah. <laughs> no, I knew I had Scorpio and uh, uh, Venus in Scorpio, but yeah. I didn't know that was a serial killer trait. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, a lot of people have Venus and Scorpio. It's a very, very common, obviously, like, you know, one twelfth of the population probably yeah. has a Venus and Scorpio. Um, so obviously, one twelfth of the population is not murderers. We but think. when it's a very kind of when it's like a very prominent ruler, and there's other things happening, uh, you notice it in a lot of sp- serial killer charts. Okay, so I I, I got the, the idea of thinking about your my hometown uh, weird terrible thing because my favorite murder like every week they have someone talk about their hometown murder and this isn't a murder this is a just one of those things I think everyone has in their hometown which is a that story that everyone talks about I grew up in northern California and this is the Concord water world uh, disaster of 1997 this is something that was talked about a whole lot uh, when I was growing up and I was living in Clayton at the time, but Concord's like one town over because we have our the big water park there. This was kind of a story of, oh, these, you know, the adults framed it as, oh, these dumb kids doing dumb things, getting hurt. Um, and I, ha- I think I have a problem with framing it as dumb kids. Well, I have a, f- a problem with anyone calling kids dumb. For um, real. Um, especially in a case where it ends in someone's death. I, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to research the, this huge story that was a part of my childhood and learn about what happened, learn about the people involved. Research came from, okay, AP News story, uh, SF Gate story about the, uh, Concord, uh, water, park disaster. If we have show notes, I'll have this. I, there was also a Dateline episode uh, that got uploaded to YouTube way back from 1997. That was really helpful. So whoever uploaded that was, thank you. You did the Lord's work. And <laughs> let's get into it. Kimby Ray Gliotti was born April 19th, 1979. She was the light of her mother, Victoria Nelson's life, and they had pretty much the perfect mother-daughter relationship. In fact, Quimby's Quimby's birth had special meaning for Victoria because her own mother had died suddenly of a stroke just after Victoria herself graduated from high school, and Quimby was born soon after that, so Victoria saw the birth of Quimby as a reincarnation of that mother-daughter bond that she had with Quimby's grandmother. Um, She named her daughter Quimby, which means life-giving in Swedish, because the newborn baby really gave her a purpose uh, and a reason for her life. Uh, Victoria had kept a collection of teacups and photo albums from Quimby's grandmother, her mother, uh, and she someday planned to leave those to Quimby when she got older. And uh, Quimby like many little Venus in Pisces, exalted Jupiter in Cancer people. Um, She was beloved by many. Uh, Her teachers and her classmates at Napa High said Quimby was a peacemaker who helped others in need. Um, Not everything was super, super perfect. Quimby, when um, she was three, her mother and father got divorced, uh, but that really tightened the bond between Quimby and her mother. Uh, Her mother describes herself as very overprotective of that mother and mother and daughter really relied on each other. 
Uh, growing up, Quimby was very attached to her mother and cried every day during sixth grade during the trip to Yosemite because oh. she missed her. Oh. <laughs> During freshman year, um, when she was in choir, she called her mom at least nine uh, times a day during their two-week trip to New Zealand. Oh, my God. They rode horses together, and they went to the Nutcracker Ballet every year. Um, Quimby was a very Venusian girl. She has a very prominent Venus, prominent Jupiter in her chart. Like, So you would think, like, this beautiful chart. Uh, you know, with with this strong benefic energy, you know, would have maybe a long life. Uh, this, yeah, I mean, either that or it sounds like but, the beginning of a movie that you know is a horror movie, and it's just like it's just too sweet. It's like too perfect. That's what I feel right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the the mother daughter relationship like sounds like the ideal relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like. Everyone at school loved her, which is pretty rare, I think, for being a high schooler. Uh, yeah, anywhere. A high schooler like, anywhere. <laughs> it seems like, yeah, where, like, you're always going to have, like, at least for me in high school, like, had people. Haters. Haters, yes. <laughs> had so many haters. But it seemed like everyone loved her. And she was a very much like a pink, pretty princess type of person. She always wore pink, always like trying to include everyone. The mother and daughter, when they were growing up, they left nothing unsaid. They held no grudges. They lived life to the fullest. The night before uh, the senior trip, so every year Napa High School goes on a senior trip to a uh, water park. A, um, and they had been in the past going to Manteca water slides, but uh, the Concord water slides had opened. They were relatively new, so they were switching things up and going to the Concord water slides instead this year. Quimby's mom was out of town at that time going on a boating trip in Washington San Juan Islands, but she called her daughter on the phone, and Quimby was really excited about the water slides the next day. And Quimby's um, mom told her, have fun and be a good girl. And it was the last time they would speak to each other. Oh, no. That's <laughs> awful. God. <laughs> and you just like your delivery of that. And it was the last time they would speak to each other. <laughs> um, uh, this is, yeah, this is. So let's set the scene. It's um, June 2nd, 1997. This is during this week, um, during this, this year, actually, I was looking up what the biggest... Uh, movies and entertainment stuff mm-hmm. was of 1997. Jurassic Park, The Lost World, which is about a theme park gone wrong, is oh, no. the number one movie in America. You're um, going to tell me that there's a reason for all this later, right? Like oh, a, yeah. An yeah. astrological reason. Yeah. I just feel this coming. <laughs> also, Titanic, a movie about a major disaster involving water, hasn't yet come out, but it was planned to be released in July, just a month later, but it did get pushed back due to delays and wouldn't end up being released until December of that year. Hmm. But nonetheless, Titanic Mania has swept the nation. Um, Titanic the Musical actually opened up on Broadway, and I did not realize there was a Titanic musical on I Broadway. I That's wild. And it actually like won a bunch of Tony Awards. I know. <laughs> And it came out the same year as Titanic the movie. What? Like, I, yeah, I know. Is this one of those like Mandela effect things? Like, I know. <laughs> like, I'm like, I did not know this. What even is that? So yeah, Titanic the musical went on to win five Tony Awards um, and a night to remember CD-ROM. CD-ROM. <laughs> we're in the 90s. We're old. <laughs> Carly, we're old. <laughs> um, hits the shelves and features the 1958 uh, film about the Titanic and commentary from Titanic experts is a very popular CD-ROM <laughs> for those of you <laughs> who are not children of the 90s. What's a CD-ROM, Carly? Um, a CD-ROM is like a DVD. You don't even know what a DVD is. Jesus. <laughs> a CD-ROM is a little silver disc that you would actually insert into your computer and <laughs> you don't know, they don't even have the slot for that anymore. I know I know <laughs> and it would open up an a program like an app <laughs> that would have a bunch of features on it that had information and video anyway th- this is what we had before the internet was what it was we had the internet back then 
But God, I'm hearing the dial-up tone right now. We needed, <laughs> yeah, the, we needed more. You couldn't really watch video on the internet back then. Oh, no, so, it was so slow. Like, so, yeah, that wasn't a thing. So you had to have, like, these CD-ROMs. Anyway, so the CD-ROM was really big. Uh, Titanic Mania was sweeping the nation. I looked up Life Magazine published June 1st, 1997, the day before the Concord Water Park disaster. Uh it features a huge headline that reads Titanic Fever, Why We Can't Look Away from Disasters. That is the headline. Oh my god. And it features a big photo of the sinking Titanic. That is why. Okay, 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 okay. Let's get into this. So, like, I want to know what happened. Tell me what happened. Okay. Um, I, oh, additional context. One, one last thing. Um, um Bop by Hanson. Do you remember that song? Mm-hmm. Um Bop is the number one song topping the charts at this time. Okay. And uh, I I looked up, the, one of the singers, Zach, says, Um Bop is a song that is about driving towards an impossible dream. It's about telling yourself, go on, go on now. Life will be over. And... Uh, you don't want it to have passed you by. That's what Umbop is about. Oh God. Um, on, also on this day, Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh was convicted of murder and conspiracy for the 1995 bombing that killed 168 people. I'm Same like, day just, as the Concord Water Park disaster. I don't know how to handle... Okay. Okay, Britain's, okay, okay, okay. Britain's Princess Diana's ball gowns and evening gr- dresses are also scheduled to go on public view at Christie's. She's raising money for AIDS charities. Okay. She will eventually die on August 31st, uh, about a little over... T- uh, about two months later. Okay. Um, but look at... This is the uh, this is the cover of the Life magazine. Titanic, oh. Why We Can't Look Away from Disasters. It has like a, a giant, giant eye. eyeball in the background. <laughs> I know. Google this if you're listening to this. Okay. So it's Monday, June 2nd, just days before graduation. And it's a sunny morning for Quimby to join her classmates from Napa High School on their senior trip to uh, Waterworld in Concord. It's about a 45-minute drive by bus, and surprisingly, it's not that warm that morning. It's at 8 a.m. when they all kind of load up on the bus. It's 52 degrees. Can you imagine? That does not sound like water parking weather. I know. (laughs) Can can you imagine going to a water park and it's 52 degrees? Pass. Pass. No. And maybe people in the Midwest are like, that's warm. Um. Well, okay. I I am the, like, resident from Montana, like, person. And not that that's the Midwest, but it's cold. And I would not go to the water park in 50 degree weather. Yeah. Uh, And even at the time of the incident... Um, which was would happen like later afternoon. It was sixty eight degrees, which is still it's not not that warm. Not this warm. is like the universe being like, don't go. <laughs> I know, <laughs> too cold. So, um, but but it is Monday, and basically the the kids kind of have the whole park to themselves. It's mm-hmm. Monday. It's June. School hasn't let out yet, and so, it's cold, so no one's there. <laughs> yeah, so it's there's probably no one there, and. Uh, okay, so for the past few week, uh, years, Napa has gone to water parks for their senior trip, and during these trips, every senior class attempts to clog the water slides. It's a tradition, and previously they've done this at Raging Waters and Manteca, and those slides were different. They were built into hillsides, mm-hmm. so you could cram all your friends on the slides, and there was nowhere for it to go because the, the slides were embedded into the hillside. Okay, okay, that and makes sense. In Concord, it's different. The slides are held up on these long, tall wooden beams. Oh, I see where this um, is going. <laughs> so the slides, in many cases, are 30, 40, 50 feet above the ground. Yeah. And they're being held up by these tall wooden beams um, and Yikes. picture cement below. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not what I want to picture. <laughs> the senior class of 1997 is attempting to... Uh, have the largest clog in history they know they can't do this right away at the beginning because they'll get kicked out of the park Mm -hmm. so they wait till they have their whole day at the park and they wait until they're about to get called back to the buses Um, but they're gonna all kind of somehow send word to each other that that they're that this is what they're gonna do yeah 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 this is the day before cell phones so somehow they manage to all communicate with each other that that, at at a certain time at a certain slide they're all gonna go and try to clog it okay their vice principal and i I actually feel kind of 
feel a certain way for this fellow. Um, Roger Ashlock told the students that the previous record for clogging the slide at Manteca was 76 students. Wait, he told them that? See, this is why I actually... <laughs> I One, I have... So things to say for those adults who are in like the comments on these videos and all these stories about uh, about the Concord water slide disaster saying the kids are stupid mm -hmm. like one I I do not think the kids are stupid I think um, and I don't think I don't even blame the vice principal for telling them this because okay. it honestly feels like something I would tell kids this is probably why I shouldn't be trusted with kids <laughs> But, no, okay, it's fine. It's like, okay, like, it's a tradition, right? They've been doing it for years, and you just kind of want to participate. And yeah. Like, yeah, okay. It's a tradition. No one is, and they've been doing it for you. like, no, no one No one's ever is, gotten hurt, really? Yeah. Like, okay, that makes sense. And he also tells them, hey, you guys, you're on a senior trip. Like, we're not going to get you in trouble. Like, he, like we're not going to expel you. Have fun, mm -hmm. you know. Don't get, obviously... If, if you do something that gets you kicked out on the par out of the park, that's on you. But he basically tells them, have a good time. And I totally, he's a cool guy. He's like, this he's gives me very much like Mean Girls, like, I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. <laughs> like, this is the vibe I'm, I'm a, getting. I'm not a regular vice principal. I'm a cool <laughs> vice principal. Exactly. I'm like, bro. 17-year-old um, uh, Linda Franco almost didn't even participate, uh, but when the kids started saying, it's happening, uh, and she heard everyone laughing and running to the slides, to the bonsai pop pipeline, that's where this happened, uh, uh, she's like... FOMO. F FOMO. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fear of missing out, she runs in. So they all entered from a platform 40 feet above the cement ground, storming past the lifeguards who are tasked with making everyone go down one at a time. And about 2.45 p.m., as the first students went, went down, they used their arms and legs to stop themselves from going all the way down, resulting in more students clogging the slide from behind them. Imagine and being that, like, first guy. <laughs> Like, I and can't. I know. One thing I was trying to, as I was researching this, I was trying to find out who was the guy that's, that, like, was the first, the first clogger. One. Yeah. Because, like, you have to be strong as hell. Like, but one, you have to be strong as hell. And two, now you have to live with yourself. Yeah, true. With what ended up happening. <laughs> What's going to happen next? And, like. I mean, I would l feel free to DM me if you were the guy at the front of the slide. Like, I just want to know. I, well, anyone, if anyone who is involved in this, like wants i i'm just curious about how you know it's been whatever how how long was 1997 ago like 30 years it's too long a long time ago <laughs> i want to know how this has affected your life i want to mm -hmm. know uh if you still think about it uh, this is a judgment-free zone totally not... judgment-free <laughs> yeah. zone and you know i'm the one who is like when the adults are like, you kids are stupid, you got what's coming to you. No, I'm no, not yeah, that person. Not, I'm like, yeah. no, this is a terrible thing that happened. It's no one's fault. It's, I just want to understand what your life experience has been life, like since this has happened mm -hmm. and how you live with it. Okay, so, uh, da -da. so they create a human traffic jam with the goal of more than 76 slides kids on the slide uh for Qu kimby who is among those clogging the slide it would be the last time she'd be together with her classmates many students uh described hearing a crack the fiberglass breaking and in a dateline interview another boy says he still hears that noise in his sleep uh, oh and a girl responds she can hear it in her sleep oh my god when the slide broke over 30 students fell from heights between 20 and 30 feet onto the hard concrete below. Oh, my God. And he, here's the thing. the um, I'll take you by the L.A. River uh, in a, like after this is over. The L.A. River is about 20 feet to, like from the top to the bottom, sure. and it's like a cement ground. Mm -hmm. I saw a woman get thrown off her horse into the L.A. River, and I did not think she survived. Somehow she did manage to survive. Mm -hmm. She was wearing this amazing helmet, which I need to get. It, like, this amazing helmet she thinks, like, saved her mm -hmm. um, so many things. Uh, but 20 feet into cement is oh, a... Oh, no. It's farther. Is yeah. a far-ass fall. That's, and plus, you're yeah. not wearing much. You're in no, your you're wearing a bikini suit. or whatever. Like, that. not to be, like, crass, but that's just, like, splat. Like, you're... <laughs> 
can't deal with this. Uh, I know. <laughs> um, so first responders describe seeing blood and broken bone everywhere. Kimby Gliotti landed on her head and suffered oh, blood no. voice, force trauma to her head. And a, she suffered a crushed chest and heart injuries and died at Mount Diablo Medical Center in Concord. Oh, God. I know. This is really, really tough. In Kimby's honor... The oh, one student on Dateline said that she honestly believes Kimby was an angel sent to Earth to bless them with her presence for a short time before it was her time to go home. In Kimby's honor, the students wore pink ribbons after the accident, and hundreds attended her funeral. In a memorial service attended by about 800 people in the school gymnasium, Kimby's friends recalled childhood games and pranks, trips and prom, and most of all, as she matured, her steadfast generosity and her devotion to her friends. In May 2000, Kimby's family settled a claim for $1.7 million against the Napa Unified School District, Waterworld USA, and its parent company, Premier Parks, and Whitewater West Industries, the slides manufacturer. And did you know, as I was researching this, there is no, like, government agency that, like, inspects slides. Like water slides? Like water slides. Like, really? Yeah. Like, it, it's all inspected basically by the industry the industry inspect it inspects itself so if you think about this that's not reassuring their motivation <laughs> is to make as much money as possible in yeah. the most cost effective way possible and they are re regulating and safety measuring themselves so if something is not quite safe but they're gonna get a lot of money for it and maybe one or two people die and they get they have to pay 1.7 million but like that's in, less than the amount that they make on it then they don't care yeah that's, then they don't care then they're gonna yeah, they're gonna yeah, 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 yeah. like let let you have the un yikes safe slide so anyway this is learning about these things has made me highly distrust amusement parks <laughs> I mean obviously the slides broke because there were 30 kids, kids in it 30 you know kids in it clogging it um and if you're going down one at a time that's that's fine but there have been other water park disasters just by one person going down the slide we'll have to kind of do this on a later episode but yeah. but um yeah amusement parks are not safe uh, i don't know <laughs> yeah uh kimby is buried at tuloke cemetery in napa and she has this beautiful bench above her grave um, and it's engraved with a song that Kimby wrote when she was 10 years old and it says I was put on this earth to make you happy I was put on this earth to make you cry I was put on this earth to make you study I was put on this earth to make you sigh God called me to a place called earth he said I had to be there at birth God's proud of me because I am doing my job so fine look at you all grown up, never getting out of line. God sent me down to do a certain job, but now it's all done and I'll miss you all so much, hun. Someday I'll see you, maybe. I love you, baby. She wrote that when she was 10. What the heck? That's wild. Now, is she the only one that died? She's the only one that died. Which is amazing. Yeah, the, and considering, like... I was reading the first responders said it looked like a war zone. Yeah. There was blood, broken bones, uh, just flesh. It was all draining into the pools. Oh, that's... That's... that's um, it was... That's a lot. Like, nightmare. It was yeah. a lot. Nightmare fuel. Uh, Kimby's father, Larry Glenn Gilotti, died in 2016. He was a salesman in the wine industry for 30 years. And on his tomb headstone, which is next to Kimby's grave, it says Kimby's dad. That's all it says. Aww. Kimby's dad. And his uh, dates were April 25th, uh, 1940 to July 30th, uh, 2016. Kimby's mom, Victoria Nelson, um, still, I think, lives in Uintville near, near Napa. And she owns a boutique. And there is a Kimby Gilati Memorial Scholarship Fund. It seems like they've... They've, there's a lot of money in it um, for the, the, I think there was like $60,000 in it. Oh, wow, or nice. Yeah, for, 
for scholarships. And here's a little ghost story uh, related to Waterworld. So in May, um, this is on, I found this on creepypasta.fandom.com yeah. under the story, The Banzai Pipeline, uh, Places That Have Ghosts. May, and this is a firsthand account story from someone who worked there, like a worker at the mm. water park. May 2011 was the month I applied at Waterworld California. It was a pretty good job. The monthly pay I got was all right, but there was too much work. Every one that works there doesn't really get along too well at times and it always has to be someone not liking someone just because they're assholes wow that's like every workplace <laughs> drama um, so by mid-season mostly around june to july my co-workers and i would start to see and notice some strange things so between june and july june 2nd was the accident mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in 1997 uh since me and my friends are the only ones that closed the park at night. We were always uh, told about the incident, um, knowing that we'd walk near the same slide where the girl had once died. Uh, the pipeline was the same as it was before the incident, although though they rebuilt it and renamed it. So same slide. I'm guessing probably there's even like the same panels other than the panel. Um, you can watch like this animated online um you can watch this kind of animation of how the slide broke yeah but like basically most of the slide was still there just like these two panels like crashed so they just so put they it just, back together so, and they were like it's fine <laughs> so they just probably replaced those two panels oh but it's God. probably all the same slide that was still there in 1997 yeah um so it was uh, a regular scheduled weekday when i noticed the first strange thing after a busy day the evening fell uh, with a strong wind, and as I was helping a co-worker with a trash run in the Luau Cove, we emptied six trash bins, each filled to the brim with garbage, put new bags in, and headed to the dumpster. There was a lot of wind coming from all directions except in the cove. Since there are four pavilions, most of the wind that comes in doesn't go through as much. The garbage cans nearby were standing straight and stationary, even with a slight wind pushing against them. By the time we walked back from the dumpsters, we passed by the luau only uh, to see the four bins tipped over and the rest still stationary. I looked at my friend in some disbelief. Since the only people working during that time in that area were them, were us, sorry, what were us, I'm talking as him, uh, no one else was there. We checked the kitchen and it was empty. The wind around that whole area was going in every direction. Um, different from outside the park. We checked uh, with our other coworkers, but they were busy with duties as well. A couple days later, we started noticing even stranger things. I was uh, by the two rentals on our lunch break uh, with my coworkers when we heard a distant scream from a teenage girl. It wasn't a joyous or or horrified scream, but a painful scream. Oof. A scream so painful that it gave me chills up my spine. I just couldn't move or say anything at all. We all heard it and just went back to work scared. Little by little, things began to occur. The showers would turn on randomly and stay on for long periods of time when we were around. Uh, we would feel a strange presence among every corner, ride, or secluded spot we would go to. These things had to happen for some reason. One day when I was heading out from my shift, I managed to speak to one of the managers explaining what was going on. He told me it was the spirit of the girl who had died wandering around the park by herself. She was going around the park screaming in pain, knocking on walls and windows, turning on faucets and showers and even knocking things over. He even said that some doors would open on their own and it was during the night when she usually does all those things. Uh, could it be that her restless spirit still roams in the park because of us or could it be something else? All I know is that she comes back only during the month of June and mid-July during closing time. The night uh, shift security and other people that have been in the park during the night time have also claimed of hearing painful screams from far away and other odd occurrences throughout the park. The very same painful screams and occurrences still haunt the park to this very day. 
Since the park has a lot of security, I wouldn't recommend staying around after closing time, uh, but if you do, stay alert. Um, and then the, one of the comments on this was, I grew up in Concord all my life and I was a young kid when the incident happened, but everyone knew about it. I used to work for a private security company and we were contracted to do security at Waterworld and I was one of the guys on the contract when I used to work night nights uh, to make sure stupid teens didn't try to sneak in and vandalize and break shit. That was becoming a problem. Weird stuff going on. Never had any of the door and slam or heard any screams, but stuff would move randomly or get knocked down, towels would get thrown as well as trash cans, and my shoulder would get tapped. It was a creepy place at night, and I did not like it at all. Yikes. So, um... That's interesting, like, the report of that versus, like, the sweet angel they said she was in, like, you know what I mean? I wonder, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just an interesting, like, juxtaposition of ideas. I wonder if the spirit is the spirit, not necessarily of her, mm -hmm. but of the incident. That would make more sense. the energy of the thing yeah. that occurred. That makes more sense. Um, like, I think when a, when a terrible thing happens, maybe it embeds itself yeah. in the like world. Like, leaves, leaves an energetic scar or, or whatever. I remember a classmate in college said that she could feel uh, places where people had died, mm -hmm. like like going on the highway, she could feel like a certain section of the highway where someone died, and she could mm -hmm. feel like that sense of being ripped from the earth. It's okay, you can knock my microphone. <laughs> Jesse is just so I'm you sorry. know what's going on here. Jesse is like re we're sitting on the floor. I'm like trying to this. like reposition, I'm like move very carefully, and then I just like smack the whole table. <laughs> totally. No no worries. Like like she would uh she went to her a guy she was dating's house and she couldn't even enter the house. She Yikes. said, Oh my god, something really terrible occurred here. Her, the guy she was dating went on the internet to see what the fuck she was talking about and i guess that house a drive-by shooting had occurred and oh my God. killed the entire family that was like sitting in on their couch um and she felt that energy that is wild so yeah so i think you i think places hold on to an energy when it when a really terrible thing happened check out this is the chart of the actual incident okay um and so uh, if, if any of you are watching at home and, or, and you want to look up this chart, it is um, at 2.45 on June 2nd, 1997 at Concord, California. And you would think, hey, this, this kind of looks like an okay chart. Um, it's a Libra rising. That means that it's a... Venus chart ruled by Venus and we have Venus in Gemini in the ninth house um, and whenever a planet is in a sign ruled by a another um, planet so Gemini is ruled by Mercury mm -hmm. um, we look to okay what's Mercury doing so Mercury is in Taurus in this chart and Venus is in Gemini. So Venus and Mercury are in each other's houses. Okay. They're they're communicating. Um notice Mercury is in the 8th house which is a house that deals with death. Okay. So whatever Venus is providing the ascendant is going to have a little touch of ninth house and a little touch of um but really a lot of of eighth house because the ruler of um, the ascendant has to has to check in has to talk to the ruler of the eighth house which is mercury in the eighth house there so we can tell that the the ascendant is being informed by that house of death the mm -hmm. eighth house that makes sense um but there's some there's just a lot going on here the uh whenever you're in a day chart the most the worst uh, planet, the most troublesome planet is going to be Mars. Right. And uh, the best planet is going to be Jupiter. 
and um, the and if it's a night chart, then you know the the best planet is going to be Venus, and the uh, worst planet is going to be Saturn. Right. Remember, day chart. Venus is not doing its best work. Okay. Yeah. Um, she's she she's doing the Venus things as in wanting to bring people together, which is a really great description of what the kids were trying to do, mm-hmm. trying to bring everyone together. But because it's a daytime chart. Um, She's not going to necessarily bring things together in a perfectly harmonious situation. There's okay. going to be a little bit of... Disaster. A no, no, bit. no, 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 not necessary. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's just not going to be as strong okay, as, okay. as could be. That makes so, sense. But we have to look at what, what uh, Mars is doing because Mars rules a seventh house, which deals with relationships and with, with other people. And Mars here in this chart is in the 12th house, mm-hmm. which is the house of self-undoing, mm-hmm. which is the house of bad uh, bad spirit. And this is the, a perfect way to explain the 12th house is that um, that little voice on your shoulder, that little devil on your shoulder that tells you, do the bad thing, yeah. eat, eat the cookie. <laughs> <laughs> clog the water slide. <laughs> yeah, clog the water slide. Yeah. And so when we look, okay, how are things going to go with other people? Uh Uh-oh. The ruler of the seventh house, uh, so the seventh house here is Aries, Mm -hmm. and the ruler of the seventh house is Mars in the twelfth house. Mm -hmm. So Mars is like doing the bad thing. So this is a great chart if you're trying to get some, convince someone to do something that's bad for them. Okay. Um, It's pretty freaking straightforward. Also... Saturn in Aries is debilitated. Um, that's like the worst position for Saturn to be in. That's the position where Saturn, uh, which is about boundaries mm-hmm. and which is about, um, you know, Saturn is kind of like the boring person who always does the right thing. The um, disciplinarian. Yeah. <laughs> what the vice principal should have been. Like the, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so this is, it's a perfect example. Like instead of the vice principal being like, hey guys, let's let's be safe today. Mm-hmm. Vice principal's like, clog the right water slide. You're yeah. not going to be in trouble. <laughs> have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was malicious either. No, no, no. I think no, it no. was just like, like. You know, have fun. So, so we can see the seventh house. He he meant well. Yeah. Um. So we can see that 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 seventh house um is a really really problematic house. That house with dealing with other people, um, and the, there's Jupiter in the fifth house, which is the house of hey, let's have fun. With which Jupiter in a day chart normally is like we're gonna have fun and we're gonna it's gonna be all good. But Jupiter is being ruled by that very, very debilitated Saturn. Um, and that very, very debilitated Saturn is being ruled by a Mars in the 12th house. So notice how it all comes back to this Mars in the 12th house. This this uh, little, little Jupiter here is like, have fun, have fun. But it's, it's coming back to this, which is that little devil on your shoulder telling you to do the thing, Mm -hmm. even though it's bad. Interestingly, also, Pluto there in the third house, which deals with, uh, you know, short distance travel. Um, So they're going to... Class trips to the water park. Water park. (laughs) So this little trip to the water park is going to end in death. Um, uh, We can also kind of look to what's the first application that the moon is going to make in its next... Uh, its next aspect. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the moon is very, it's, it's, it's kind of a void moon. The moon is kind of, it's going to be a while before it makes its next aspect, um, which is going to be Mercury. Uh, And, and um, Mercury is often, I see Mercury so much in charts that deal with death. When my when my uh, dog died, it was a Mercury Venus Pluto conjunction. Okay. Um, because c- Mercury is that god that like helps ferry you to the underworld. Oh right. And and the moon, uh, it's it, like it's gonna be a little while till it makes that aspect to Mercury. But the moon there is in the eighth house, which mm-hmm. is the house of death. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, 
it's it's a really really interesting chart and i was also looking at because uh, kimby was born in 1979 uh she had pluto in libra and interestingly um when this disaster happened saturn which is also a planet that's associated with death was like exactly opposite her her pluto which is oh that's yeah, interesting I know, isn't it um so that's really really interesting there's a and in that uranus in the fifth house uranus is that planet of chaos mm-hmm. and um and like let's let's go crazy yeah let's have fun yeah let's do the let's do the risky thing um and there is the little neptune there right at the anoretic degree of a saturn sign yeah um, neptune is like confusion and it and Mars is kind of moving into a little trine aspect with Neptune there. Um, and whenever a planet's at the anoretic degree, that's when it's the most uh, malefic. Mm. Uh, Why is that? Uh, because the, the last uh, degree of a sign is usually ruled. In the ancient times, they had, they had like little parts of the zodiac ruled by planets as well Mm -hmm. so like little kind of slices and so the last degree of a sign is always either ruled by mars or saturn which are you know (laughs) mars is which are problematic (laughs) yeah problematic mars is the planet of like strife illness death um death by accidents uh saturn is like death by suffocation death by uh death by restriction, death by old age. Um, so there's a lot of death signatures in this chart. Um, it's really interesting. But it, but it makes me also think of that Neptune in the last degree of Capricorn, where Capricorn is being ruled by Saturn, debilitated in mm-hmm. Aries. Um, makes me wonder why, maybe that's why everyone was so Titanic obsessed. Yeah. And so uh, amusement park disaster, Jurassic Park, amusement park disaster yeah Um, you have like all of the planets being like jupiter like oh let's have fun but then also like yeah the disaster stuff all happening in there it's like this theme of we want to have fun and do great things but we're all gonna die (laughs) yeah well you know jupiter there is in a saturn ruled sign as well and saturn is debilitated this is um you know uh and saturn's gonna be you know while saturn's in aries that means like it's gonna be like two years of Mm -hmm of Saturn not doing really well. So it makes sense that people are like, let's dive into to exploring movies and media about things that go terribly wrong. Yeah, giant tragedies and yeah, lots of people dying. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Super interesting. So Kimby's chart, I don't know her exact birth time, but... Um, so I don't know her birth time at all, but I pulled up her chart and she's an Aries. Uh, she's got her son in Aries. Um, she has Venus in Pisces where, where Venus is exalted. So that's why she's very into pretty princess stuff. And she was very into uh, being nice to her friends and her love, her friends loved her. And um, she has Jupiter in the last degree of cancer. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? It is. Um, now, Jupiter is exalted in Cancer, but the last degree of Cancer um, is exactly opposite the last degree of Capricorn. So, at the t- um, she was born, uh, so she was born with this Jupiter um, in the last degree of Cancer, and then when Neptune came along. And when she was 17 or 18, whenever this happened, Mm -hmm. um, Neptune then was exactly opposite her Jupiter. So that is really interesting. It makes me think that, um, that, that Neptune was triggering, you know, that, that Neptune is water too. Mm -hmm, Neptune is associated with water. Yeah. I almost wonder if she was a Sagittarius uh, rising or a Pisces rising Mm -hmm. because those two signs are ruled by Jupiter. And so then if the ruler of her ascendant starts getting opposed by Neptune, like this 
traveling, which is a very Jupiter thing, traveling with a group of people um, to a place that she will, you know, die by water. Mm-hmm. Um, is re- and also at the same time, uh, her Saturn was being opposed by Pluto, which is also like... So her, her, her Jupiter then. was being opposed by Neptune and her Saturn was being opposed by Pluto. It's like pretty two huge outer planets, mm-hmm. like interacting with her planets at the same in exact time yeah. in like a really, really big way. And if she had, um, you know, and if this is the range of where her moon was. Yeah. So it could also be like her um that neptune was maybe over her moon mm-hmm. at the time that this happened and interestingly her <coughs> her uh mom was in washington on a boating trip right more she water I, you said that in the beginning and i was like hmm <laughs> i know but there's such a mother theme too yeah where does that show up in her chart do you well um, the moon is whenever you want to kind of know what uh, what the mother situation is like. You look at the moon, and in this case, the moon. I really strongly think the moon was in the in Capricorn it, um, because um, the moon is in Capricorn. There, it's debilitated. Okay, uh, that's like the worst place for the moon to be in. And I think you know that doesn't necessarily mean that she had a bad relationship. I I I. I honestly think it would probably make sense that, like, uh, they had, like, a really great relationship. Um, you know, the the moon opposite Jupiter kind of points to they're maybe far apart when they die, when she, when Kimby dies. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really interesting. And when even they, though they're opposite, like, there's still that... Um, Jupiter's a good planet. Yeah, like, especially, it's still a connection. Even and it's, if it's... Especially an exalted Jupiter. And it's a Jupiter in Cancer, and Cancer is ruled by the moon. Mm-hmm. So you can tell that there's a really strong bond there between the mother and daughter, um, mm-hmm. because that Jupiter is in that moon sign. Right, that um, makes sense. But there, there are opposites there, which, which you know... You know, that Capricorn, Capricorn and those Saturn ruled signs are signs associated with endings mm-hmm. and with with death and um, with the border between this world and the spiritual world. Yeah. It's really fascinating. But so that- do you think that, like, knowing the astrology of these things, like, do you think if they would have decided to do that at a different time of day or uh, I- if they would have gone on a different day? Or something. I think it was fated to always happen. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's what astrology tells us. It's like the thing is going to happen. Um, like, final, final destination. Like, oh my God. <laughs> like, like it's, I think it's, it, it, it's just destined to happen. Like, I can think of, you know, times when I try to, like, astrologically time things that are really important. Like, I'm going to send out this email this really important time. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you just get a feeling and you're like, ah, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. And then you look at the chart afterward, and it doesn't go well, and then you look at the chart afterwards, and you're like, oh. This was always going to be. <laughs> yeah, this was always just, it was this always, always going to be a problem, yeah. It was always not going to work out. And there, I wonder if there is some spiritual cycle dealing with mothers and daughters in this family, in mm-hmm. this generational family, because it's, there's a mother daughter theme, yeah. you know, cycling over and over again, and I-, I wonder if there's something karmically that that spiritual path, that that family, that generation has to learn about the mother daughter relationship, mm-hmm. um, or maybe it's just that positive because mother daughter relationship has to cycle and repeat maybe to bring something down to earth down to the material world um that makes sense in a good way to remind people of um something and maybe like my you know being fascinated by the story and deciding to tell the story maybe that might trigger something positive in the world maybe um someone reads that story you know, maybe someone sees that bench, sees that song that she wrote. Yeah, it maybe. inspires them in some way. Or even the chart continuing now and being like, we're talking about it. Yeah. You know. And interestingly, we, we are talking about this, uh, this story while Venus is in Gemini right now. That's weird. Did you do that on purpose? No. I, no. <laughs> 
and and um and uh, mercury right now is in taurus and when this happened mercury was in taurus that's and venus so was in gemini that's so weird i can't <laughs> i think we're drawn to certain things yeah um, patterns uh adam ellen boss who's like this astrologer on youtube who's really good he was talking about uh uh, Mercury in Taurus, and he started noticing every time Mercury's in Taurus, he feels himself drawn to watching Clint Eastwood movies. That's weird. And <laughs> Clint Eastwood has Mercury in Taurus. Really? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So I think you're kind of like drawn to certain things, like, mm -hmm. and maybe whenever, uh, when eventually Saturn goes back into Aries, um, which will be like two and a half, three years from now, people will be like. Titanic. <laughs> oh no, no more Titanic movies. Hansen. I don't want. I don't want more Titanic movies. <laughs> Jurassic Park. Uh, another round of Jurassic Park movies. Um, my my friend is having his Saturn return when Saturn is in uh, Aries. Mm -hmm. so occasionally, we've been talking about what's gonna be. I'm like, well, Saturn's debilitated in Aries. Mm -hmm. Um, so good luck. <laughs> boundaries not being clear. Uh, oh, that's frustrating. Boundary, you know, not being able to say no. Yeah. Which is a theme that happened here in, in the this, water yeah, park nobody, disaster. Yeah, with that one girl too joining in and. Yeah. Linda. Yeah, she's like, I don't really want to do it. And then everyone else is like, let's do it. And she's like, fine. She, yeah. <laughs> I would like to see her chart. And she um, she ended up in the, in the Dateline episode. I think she ruptured her liver or something. Oh. And ha had a broken rib. Oh, my God. Like, so, and took a Instant while. regret. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to do this thing because everyone else is doing it. And then. And liver. think of Titanic. Um, We're going to. Uh, have this big ship and not have enough lifeboats. lifeboats. Who's idea? Yeah, I guess if you're touting the ship as unsinkable, there's not really a reason to have all the lifeboats in their mind, probably. Like, if it's unsinkable, you don't need them. Stupid planning. Yeah. But yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. Um, and in, uh, interested touting an unsinkable ship... Uh... I'll have to look up the the chart for the Titanic, but I wonder if I wonder if Saturn was in Aries. I'll have to look it up. Okay, later. okay. okay. <laughs> but it just uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Um, uh, I think we should start. On, we should end on some sort of positive note. Oh God! Maybe how? <laughs> in, maybe in future episodes, I will be smart and have like a a really well thought out good story. But I thought um, I I this is just something random. I was researching. Um, because I personally have a moon that is in a very just bad situation in my chart. Mm. And uh, so I was kind of like bemoaning, um, am I ever going to be okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking up the chart of um, Joseph Haydn, uh, who in the 1700s, uh, what eventually became the most famous uh, composer in Europe. Mm -hmm. He has the shittiest moon. Shittiest. Okay, that's good. And that's let good me news. tell you his life story. He uh, ha completely void moon, not making any aspects anywhere. Um, and during his early life, he got... He was starving. He didn't get fed. He he was basically like an orphan uh, scrounging for scraps. Mm -hmm. um, then in his early adult life, he would make, he would write music and um, just give it away. Mm -hmm. And so other people would then publish and play his music and get paid for the music that he wrote. What? Major <laughs> like plagiarism mad for issues. him. <laughs> yeah, mad for him. And then during his first uh, Saturn return, oh, I really wish I like had the whole story here so I could, because I'm probably making things wrong now, but during his first Saturn return, that's basically when he got his good, his first gig um, working for someone, wealthy person, uh, who is like his... Uh, patron mm -hmm. you know um how that ha happened back then yeah where where you a wealthy person would be like i'm gonna pay you to make music that sort of thing for my thing the good old days yeah <laughs> and then uh during his second 
Saturn return, which happens when you're in your 60s, mm-hmm. uh, he became the most famous composer in Europe. So there's hope. So there's hope. It's just uh, you have to, you, you just have to keep at it, keep, you know, keep plugging away. I think that's an away. interesting uh, question that we always have about, well, not you probably, but I always have about astrology that I come back to when I look at charts like this is like, is it inevitable? Is everything inevitable? In in maybe, I feel like the answer probably is like maybe not in the way you think, you know, yeah. like you don't think it's like it's not going to pan out exactly how you think it's going to. But yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I feel like there is some aspect of inevitability. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yeah. But you're learning about zodiacal releasing. That makes me really think like it's all planned out. We have no control. No, I don't Someone like this. Someone described <laughs> it some, as a you're on a plane going a certain direction and you can do whatever you want on the plane yeah but you're still gonna end up in the same spot wherever you're predestined to go interesting or your plane will crash but maybe it's predestined to crash <laughs> okay remember when you said we were gonna end on a positive note oh, yeah <laughs> oh i always <laughs> yeah so uh, if it, oh if you've enjoyed any of this, um, please uh, do like and subscribe. I guess we don't even have this. <laughs> how up. does this work? <laughs> well, we need to learn how podcasts work. Yeah. Um, and if you didn't like us, uh, definitely keep leave it a, to yourself. No, leave a comment because it helps the algorithm. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, share on social media and talk about how terrible we are because then more people will see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk about uh, how how much you hate us. That's good. <laughs> Um, still not getting that positivity, Carly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I hope you enjoyed, and we're going to have future episodes where we're going to talk about uh, terrible things that have happened and then dissect the astrology of it and then try to, in the future, end on something positive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Music for the show is provided by Bruno Loreto. Follow us on Instagram at the Astrology of Terrible Things. All one word.